fine. Working now? Okay. The basic concept is that uh, we have some guy, an entrepreneur, who sets up a server and an access point uh, at the middle of the network. Um, he connects his server to some sort of upstream services like mobile or PSTN networks or voice over IP trunks. Um, and then around the community, uh, customers of his deploy mesh routers, for instance, in these, these houses around here. And what happens is they all form a collective mesh. So uh, by mesh networks, they talk to each other rather than necessarily talking to a central access point as the first uh, point of call. Uh, as, as different houses install meshes, that effectively extends the coverage of the mesh network. Um, and what we're trying to do is come up with a, a business and a technical side that will allow a second or third world person to deploy a small uh, community-based telephone network. So some of the goals, um, we're looking at small telco businesses for the second or third world. Um, it's important that it's a, a self-sustaining business. Um, we're not interested in paying lots of money, dropping stuff into a country, walking away and hopefully it works. A lot of that's been tried and uh, it's a good way to ruin a project. Um, you need something that will be self-sustaining and that's why we put a guy who's got a business interest in the middle of it. Um, he'll be really interested in keeping this thing going because it's his income and he'll put, be putting some money down to set up the system. It, it's not donation, it's not AIDS. Uh, not aid, sorry. <laughs> um, so we're looking for self-sustaining business models and we're hoping that'll support viral growth because that's been a very strong mechanism in well, the rest of the world for growing technologies. Does it make sense as a business? Scalable up and down. Um, we're interested in starting with quite small networks, uh, much smaller than you would traditionally consider for a telephone network. So the scalability is quite important, in particular in the down direction. The sort of person who might run it is some guy who's got you know, a little bit of a geeky outlook, but not really, you don't have to be a computer export, expert, it'll all be web-based GUIs and as far as he's concerned and plugging cables together. So you don't have to be a real telephony hacker or hacker of any sort to make it work or have an extensive uh, education. Um, five that, what we looked at was a business model. Um, in particular, we were targeting the townships of South Africa, um, as a starting point at least, and what could we do with $5,000 capital, uh, which of course not everyone has, but there are people out there who have that sort of money and of course you only need one in a thousand or so to start a, a business like this. A uh, significant chunk of change but doable. Um, we know this from experience. And a business model that will break even in six months. So he'll put his money down, he'll work hard, six months later he'll have a profitable business and be able to pay down that investment. Um, and the whole concept is grounded in, in workable business models. So we spend as much time working on the technology as we do on the business models, the spreadsheets, and we've got people on our team who are working on on just that. Okay, so some of the components. Um, the mesh potato will be a device, look a little bit like this, a little mesh router that we will plug uh, an analog telephone into, like this, regular analog telephone. That'll sit on someone's house, might be on the outside of the wall up to the eaves, could even be indoors. Um, it will be powered from the mains or optionally from 12 volts, uh, so it can take a variety of uh, uh, power uh, sources. Uh, they plug the analog telephone into, when it switches on it associates with the rest of the mesh and extends uh, the uh, Wi-Fi network that carries the telephone calls um, and it gives them telephony in their house. Um, Batman is the mesh networking protocol which I'll talk quite a bit about in a moment um, that makes lets all these uh, devices link together. Um, the other component is uh, at the gateway there's a server with some billing systems. We need an entrepreneur uh, we need optionally some upstream VoIP and PSTN uh, connectivity. The system will work standalone or it can be uh, connected to upstream um, sources. There are some applications where it may be, like a particularly isolated area, it may be useful just to have local telephony and not necessarily uh, connect to upstream sources. But in general, it'll be uh, switched out to the regular telephone networks. Uh, modest amount of capital uh, and of course a business model to fit around all that. So this is what the entrepreneur will get for his $5,000. Uh, we have uh, asterisks running on some sort of server uh, with a billing system. 
Uh, he'll have some access points like this that'll sit. Uh, these particular ones are the Ubiquity Nanostation 2. I've got a few over on the side here you can have a look at later on. Uh, they have a sector-based antenna, so you'd have them up on a pole, 120 degrees apart. Um, they've got an 8 dB antenna and uh, an Atheros processor inside. So that forms the start of the network. And then he gets a kit of these mesh potatoes that get distributed around the village. Um, the way it works uh, will be via a uh, calling card type system. So he'll, when the customers buy the hardware, they'll be issued with calling cards. You don't have to have the hardware to get a calling card. Some guy could put one in his cafe and uh, people could just walk up and use it as a service. Um, and these will be distributed uh, to customers who will then make telephone calls. Uh, Dabba is uh, the company that we're modelling, I guess, our network on. Um, they're a real company in South Africa. Uh, they have, I guess, what you call a prototype village telco network in Orange Farm, a township near Johannesburg. Uh, they're using commodity um, uh, Wi-Fi and VoIP hardware like ATAs and access points at the moment, SIP telephones, and they're working with us and, and really keeping us grounded as to what, what will work. Uh, as technologists and geeks, we tend to run away and get excited about the hardware, but we keep getting dragged back to uh, what's going to work in the real world. Um, the way they work is they've got free local calls on the mesh, so you can call someone who's on your particular mesh network, um, but if you want to go out to the PSDN then you use uh, prepaid calling cards um, that you can buy uh, from various sources around the, the township. And that's working quite well. So the natural comparison is with cell phones. There's a lot of cell phones around the world, there's a lot in Africa. Um, the problem, unfortunately, of connectivity hasn't been sold. Um, the killer is call costs. Um, the call costs are very expensive on a per call basis and really limit the use of these systems. Um, so a little bit like here, you know, we use our internet a lot more than we use our uh, mobile phones for connectivity and for good reason. Uh, also, I guess one big difference is there's a community approach. Um, we're using open software, open hardware. It'll be a guy in the community running this thing, not some faceless uh, uh, executive who owns the thing, uh, you know, from halfway around the world or something. So it's a small community-based approach. And that's something I really like about it because I like uh, community de development models like uh, Linux and open source software and hardware. Uh, we're using unlicensed spectrum, whereas cell phone spectrum is very heavily licensed. Um, you know, there's no way anyone's going to get access to that who's not, uh, doesn't jump through a lot of hoops and pay a lot of money. Infrastructure, cost and availability. Well, you can't get much of a cell phone network for five grand, that's for sure. Are you talking millions? Um, it's not just the handsets. Uh, I know they're cheap, but cell phone towers aren't. And uh, often infrastructure isn't available. You may not have electricity to run uh, a cell phone tower and all the other bits and pieces you need. Um, sites, roads to get there, access it, landline, trunks to lay down. Um, whereas we can run ours off 12 volts if we have to, in the middle of nowhere off a solar panel. Um, cell phone networks don't scale down. Um, they don't, sorry, this question? Must be an echo. <laughs> um, cell phone networks don't scale down very well. Um, if you're a village or a couple of villages a long way away from the regular networks and infrastructure, you're not going to get cell phone coverage and no one's ever going to put it in for you. Um, however, one of these networks you can deploy anywhere. Um, and I guess an idea that's been put forward to me recently is uh, the idea of cell phones as a, a walled garden. Um, if you compare cell phone networks to the internet, well, one obvious comparison is how much does it cost to send a text considering, uh, compared to an equivalent amount of text on the internet. Um, a good way of looking at it, this and a friend of mine called Steve Song has blogged on this recently, uh, what, ha what would happen if the internet had turned out like the cell phone networks? Um, you know, if, it was all, if you think about peering on the internet, uh, it's easy. You try to peer on a cell phone network to another network, they charge you for it. Um, can you put your own server up on a cell phone network? You know, it's a bit hard. So. I think there's some real, drawing that analogy a bit further, I, I really like ideas that work around open standards, community based, um, rather than these walled gardens that uh, happen when big business and, uh, and government get involved. Okay, so talking a little bit about Batman, um, better approach to mobile ad hoc networking. This is from a bunch of people uh, in particular, I believe, around Berlin, the Freifunk Network, who've developed this and, and other people around the world. Um, Regular networking is like this. This is what we're all using at the moment. Uh, we have an access point somewhere and we're all connecting to it. That's infrastructure node. In ad hoc, it goes peer to peer. So uh, if your laptops would talk directly to each other, if you're having a, a chat session or sending an email, for instance, or perhaps not an email, but uh, if you had data to transfer. So they go peer to peer rather than needing the central 
uh, infrastructure mode. I guess ad hoc mode hasn't been that popular to date and isn't that well supported by drivers, but it does have some really interesting possibilities, uh, which I'll address just a few of. Um, I'm not an expert in mesh networking. I've learned everything I know over the last few months, but uh, I, so uh, any questions, I might end up referring you to our, our Google group for extensive answers, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Uh, one advantage is um, to simply extended range over the infrastructure mode. Um, for instance, if you're C, it can be pretty infuriating if you can't see an access point, but you can see two other guys. Um, now, why, why shouldn't you be able to just simply transmit your message through these guys and therefore extend the range of the mesh way outside what a single ac access point can handle? Uh, for instance, you, there might be a big building between you and A, but you might have this guy sitting just around the corner. So uh, that's one advantage of mesh networks. Extending the range, it can also, obviously that can help you get around interference. If there's a big interferer over here that's stopping you getting through, there might be another path that you can get through through a mesh network. Problems with mesh networks are they're unstructured. Um, when you set an access point up, you sort of know where it is. You can take some care to mount it high, put a decent antenna on it. But someone just switching on their access point or their laptop or their Wi-Fi device, you, know, you really know, don't know where it's going to be uh, when it switches on or what's going to happen to it when it is on. Um, it's an unreliable medium. It's all going over Wi-Fi. So uh, any routing information has to put up with that unreliable medium as well. It might get messed up uh, as you transmit it. Uh, Wi-Fi can come in and out, and you sort of never know how it's going to be from one moment to the next. Uh, much less reliable than, say, Ethernet. Um, dynamic changes. Um, someone could pull the, pull the plug on one of the nodes in the mesh and suddenly you've lost a route um, that was going through that node. Um, car might park in front of a building, re reflections and multipath will stop the radio working. So that's uh, a few of the problems with uh, mesh networks. Uh, Batman is one in a long line of mesh networks, as qu uh, mesh network protocols. There's quite a few out of there. Um, from what I can gather, one, it's one of its... Uh, unique, reasonably unique features is distributed intelligence. Each mesh in the node only knows a little bit about routing. Um, the basic problem is if you want to route a message across the mesh, you need to know which nodes to go to. Some protocols remember the total path. Batman simply has a, a good guess at where the next best path is for your packet. And then the next node from there has another guess about where the best path is. It's not quite a guess. Um, there's uh, uh, Batman originator messages that flow through the network to help determine what's the best path to a particular node. So the sort of statistics each node knows is available nodes, uh, the total metric, but most importantly just the best next hop for each destination. It doesn't store the full, routing path, uh, the full routing path, and it does work quite well as nodes come and go. Um, this thing's being used in practice around the world. One example is a 500 node uh, mesh network in uh, Berlin. Okay, so I've got a bit of a demo um, over here. We've got a uh, three-node mesh network running on some um, these sort of access points. I'm sorry, I can't lift it, lift it very far. There's some cables in the way, but um, come over and check it out later. Basically, there's three um, access points that are running mesh network software, open WRT uh, with the uh, Batman uh, daemon running in user mode. Um, so it's just basically commodity Wi-Fi hardware. It'll run on most uh, you know, WRT-type boxes. We're running on Atheros. Uh, uh, wireless cards and systems. Um, it could even run on things like x86s. So uh, I'll just get some screens up here. Okay. Still working, good. Okay, so I'm pinging um, from my laptop, but I also put it on the mesh network just as I arrived here. So I'm, I'm pinging one of the nodes in the mesh. Um, we can get some statistics of the mesh up. Um, that's the Batman x86 executable. Um, don't worry about the big long name. Basically what I'm just telling is it to uh, connect in debug mode. And it gives us some statistics. Can that be read okay? Thank you. Oh man, some other people have connected. That's you, isn't it, Kim? <laughs> it, makes the, uh, it makes it go a bit longer, a bit harder to read. But okay. Um, my IP is basically 1.10. And what it's telling me, if I want to connect to this guy, this is the next best hop I should make. I should connect, which is logically connecting straight to that guy. And this is a metric, which is pretty much a full metric. Um, now, let's see if we can find a counterexample. This guy, if I want to get to 1.103, I have to connect via 
this node in the mesh network. Oh, and see it just flipped over then? That's because it's recalculating the meshes, uh, the hops dynamically, and it's now saying to connect to him, and now it's back again. Probably me standing in the way. So it recalculates the routes dynamically, as you can see. Now, I can sort of simulate or force a few route changes too, show you what would happen. Um, what I can do on my machine is block the route to 1.3, and that'll force the mesh to find another route through the network for me. So I'll just do that. So that's just a little script that uh, does a little bit of filtering. I'm just, um, to simulate someone parking a bus between me and uh, uh, 1.3, I've just put a firewall rule, rule to, bop, to block the MAC, to, uh, block the direct path. So now you can see, in, instead of when I want to go to this guy, 1.3, now I've got to go via 1.2, and he's got a next hop that's 1.3. Um, oh, now it's swapped around again, but you can see it's not going directly. So that's an example of how the mesh network uh, self-configures, self-heals. Uh, as things uh, go on, go over it. Now, to get it running, I've written a script. Very simple. It's just a, it's just a, uh, a user mode daemon, and I'll show you a new URL we can download all this and some instructions in a moment. If, if any of you are sitting in the audience with a laptop and would like to have a go at getting on the mesh um, while I'm talking here. That's the URL there. Um, setting up the mesh network will, so the, while I'm talking here, just grab that file if you're on the internet already. Um, I'll keep this slide up for a few minutes while you do that. And there's a readme, uh, that's sort of like a readme for it which will give you all the other instructions. You need to bring your internet connection down to run the demo. So, uh, well that's why we get the uh, readme text file rather than keeping it up on a browser that we might close accidentally. Uh, on, a, on a PC, it's just an x86 user mode daemon. Um, we have had some problems that not all drivers will work in ad hoc mode. Uh, just basically, people have been using infrastructure mode for so long that the ad hoc support isn't perfect on all wireless cards. Um, we, that's been part of our project to get it working really well on the platform that we've chosen. Um, and then just choose a random IP in this sort of range here and see if you can connect. Um, Kim informs me we have internet connectivity across the mesh as well. Not yet, he's working on it. <laughs> what you can do with Batman nodes is you can advertise one of them as having an internet connection and uh, that will then act as a gateway for other nodes on the mesh. Um, yes, yes. And you can um, tell it to jump around to the best one or in some cases you want to fix it at a particular node on the mesh. Yeah. Um, I think so. I think so. That's something I haven't played with yet. So, um, some of the challenges for the village telco is we're trying to make a sort of turnkey business, a bit like a franchise for people. So we need to make it really easy for the guys running this to do you know, customer and, and billing management. So we need some sort of software with GUIs and forms he fills in for each customer. We need a way of um, developing calling cards. Now they can be as simple as writing out uh, pin numbers and usernames on a piece of paper and handing them out. You know, that with, with, we're thinking second and third world here, it doesn't have to be go down the print shop and that sort of thing. Um, one of the big challenges we had we, when we met to discuss this was that, um, okay, we're going to have a mesh network, that's great. How are we going to connect devices and people to the network? Um, the obvious choice was to use Wi-Fi phones. You can buy these. They're the you know, size of a cell phone. They're not terribly mature at this point in time. Battery range is an issue. The other thing is Wi-Fi, the range is a real big issue. You don't really know how far you're going to get. In practice, we were getting... Uh, the people who were testing these in the field were getting perhaps 100 metres if at best. So what that meant was that we needed a bunch of other nodes in the mesh network to sort of act as access points for the Wi-Fi phones. Um, the other problem, of course, all the Wi-Fi phones are very closed beasts. None of them run, well, not many of them that I know have run Linux, closed drivers. There's no way you can hack them and make them run Batman directly. You'd have to make them run a uh, infrastructure mode. So what we were looking at was a bunch of Wi-Fi phones plus a bunch of mesh networks uh, best, uh, mesh devices in the network to relay the signal. And so we 
we did a bit of brainstorming and came up with the idea of combining um, a mesh router, one of these, with uh, an analog telephone adapter. Um, these are devices that you can plug an analog telephone into and convert it to a voice over IP signal. But um, because we knew a little bit about the hardware and what's involved, we decided that we could merge these things two together, build them for approximately the same price as the mesh router, um, and then we simultaneously give people the access devices via the telephone as well as building out our mesh network. So it was a really neat low-cost solution, um, and currently that's what I'm involved in building, both software <coughs> and hardware, uh, with a few other people in the team. So what it will look like in production... Uh, it'll be a box like the one uh, I held up, something of that sort of size. It'll have an RJ11 phone connector that you'll plug a regular analog telephone into. That could be a cordless phone or it could even be the on the end of a 100 metre cable or something. And it will also have uh, an internet RJ45. Um, and we're targeting just roughly the same sort of price as uh, a regular router would cost today. I, I really don't know what it will end up retail. And there's many other exciting business models we can use uh, for this device than just the regular sort of retail selling. Um, it's n we're not designing the network initially for data, only for voice. That lets us manage it and get the quality really good. Um, and, but it's all open hardware and software, so we can upgrade it at any time to uh, uh, take uh, data as well. QoS over Wi-Fi is a bit of an issue. We just simply get around that by saying no data in the first implementation. Um, so the mesh potato design... Um, we're using a low-cost system on a chip, Atheros uh, chipset, similar to what's used in that router. Um, that gets the cost down uh, very low, and uh, because it's similar to other router designs, makes it fairly easy to engineer. Uh, maximum use of existing open-source components. Uh, we're running a version of OpenWIT that's been optimised for our particular application and with all our software components. We're using MAD Wi-Fi drivers. Um, we've been in working with the actual MAD Wi-Fi developers to get a few uh, persistent bugs worked out. Now it's working really well and really reliably on the Atheros uh, SOC. There were a few initial problems with ad hoc mode uh, that we've worked around. Um, one of the great things about this is some of the people we're working with, they, they literally live near or, or know the developers of some of these drivers. So it's really working out well from an open source point of view. Um, one big problem I was worried about was the CPU load. Um, these little router processors aren't very powerful. They're only 180 megahertz not much of a cache, and I wanted to do some serious real-time digital signal processing, for instance, running the Speaks codec um, and Oslec, uh, which is an open-source echo canceller. So uh, one of the first things we did was spend a fair bit of effort getting all this software running on an existing router that used the same chipset and making sure the software would run fast enough. And the next challenge that we're working on now is uh, developing a FXS port interface. Um, these SOCs don't have very good interfaces, so you have to... Uh, come up with something a little bit different to get the speech signals in there. Um, this is a block diagram of the hardware. Um, the Atheros SOC we're looking at using, it's an AR2315 or AR2317. That's a low-cost processor that has all the radio built onto the same chip. Um, one, one of the cool things about open hardware is if you can just sort of decide how much software or, or sorry, how much uh, memory you need. You know, often on these embedded devices you're running out of flash or running out of RAM. So we can just opt to, opt to put in the chips that suit us. So we'll have about double the memory resources of a conventional router. Only costs a few cents more in volume. Um, has the FXS port connected by some glue logic, Ethernet um, and 802.11bg on these devices. I guess I should stress, though, that most of the uh, functionality is uh, from the software. Um, like a lot of these hardware devices, um, 95% of the effort and the work uh, goes into the, the software, and uh, that's what makes the device so powerful, all the wonderful open source software that you, know, you guys have all helped develop. Um, so we're running OpenWRT, um, just at the moment a fork of uh, the Kamikaze trunk uh, that will hopefully merge back in sometime. Uh, Mad Wi-Fi uh, with Batman, Asterix. We're using the Speaks codec, that's an open source speech codec rather than something like G729. The reason for that is, I mean, the whole thing's open, hardware, software. We don't want to go to a proprietary codec. And we're going to be deploying these things in a big enough number that we can start saying to ITSPs, this is the codec we're using, now, now put some translation in, rather than uh, what's traditionally the case where open source projects like Asterix have to work out a way to use proprietary codecs. So I'm quite keen on using uh, free codecs for this and uh, keeping it entirely patent-free. 
Um, and as a fallback, we've also got GSM running on it, as well as the Auslec uh, echo canceller. Whenever you connect to two wire telephones, you need some sort of echo cancellation. And Auslec's been proven to work better than, uh, for instance, the echo canceller in your common ATAs um, and in many uh, asterisk systems. Uh, and it's open, entirely free. So the plan, um, we're working through just a bunch of milestones. The first one that we finished about a month ago was the software. We got pretty much all the target hardware, uh, software for the mesh potato running on a commodity router. Um, next step is we're starting on the hardware and board layout. Uh, I'm working on some of the design and we're working with the Chinese partners at Com in China to do the board layout and prototype manufacture. Then towards the middle of the year we'll be doing some beta testing of the hardware and hopefully into production a little after that. Open hardware. Um, this is something you may not have all heard of, but something I've been playing around for about three years. Um, it's real. Um, this is a, an IP PBX. It runs Asterix. It's very about as powerful as a one gigahertz uh, Pentium computer. It does a bunch of DSP. It's totally open. You can go and download the design files for this and build one very similar if you like. Several thousand of these have been made, and uh, a lot of people are using these out in the real world. So open hardware is a real thing. People are starting to design hardware, open hardware for open um, applications. I'll pass that around for those of you who haven't had a play. Um, IP04. And the, I guess the point I want to make here is um, so often we say, gee, this cool product's coming out. I wonder if we can reflash that. Gee, this cool, this and that. I wish it had this feature. Well, we can do it. We can design it. We can make our, real, uh, our own products um, that are open as well. And that's something I'd like to see more of. And uh, it can even work business-wise. I earn my income off selling those things. Um, so open hardware is keeping me and my family fed. Uh, it's a little bit different to regular, I guess, closed product development. I get the benefit of a bunch of uh, the community who help me. Um, people report bugs, uh, both hardware and software, and we can work together to fix them. No closed drivers, nothing like that. Everything you can get into and fix. Sometimes you can use a novel hardware solution to fix something because you've got control over the hardware as well as the software. Um, and we've had, uh, we've had some um, courageous partners, I guess, who have been keen to work with us outside of normal uh, business models and work with us for volume manufacture. And um, I get an email or two a month now, people saying, can I please build those for you? Um, so people are interested in this sort of stuff. It gives, say, manufacturing companies an ability to build products they wouldn't be able to develop otherwise, just like open source software gives people the ability to build products they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Yes? Yes, yes, that's actually a Meraki there. Yeah. Can you ever uh, crash this with some new software? Yes, but it's tough to do, so we're going to build a better one. <laughs> okay. Yes, that, that is a, that's another issue. Someone may start off uh, with an open software community friendly product and then they may decide to close it later on. The board makes a decision. Too bad, guys. Um, well, I publish all the circuits for that. If I, if I decide I want to get rich tomorrow and just sell that uh, purely for profit and uh, in a closed way, you guys can go work around that and you'll still have the hardware available. Um, the other thing is, I guess, that I'm quite excited about that hasn't really happened yet but might soon is there's opportunities for different uh, novel business models. Um, most hardware products you buy cost three to five times what they cost to manufacture. Um, I'm interested in um, some models for the developing world where an NGO, like the OLPC, NGO says, I want, uh, want 20,000 phone lines. Here's a, you know, X thousand dollars to go build them at cost plus ten percent from a factory, um, and the profits don't necessarily go to have to have to go to some sort of first world company. Um, they can be used to build more product. Um, completely open and keeping it that way. And that's what I'm sort of interested in. Africanization. Okay. Um, the problem is, uh, as I said, a lot of the people on the team have been deploying. Typically, they take something out of the first world, like an ATA or a laptop or whatever, they take it into the third world and it breaks after a few months because, for instance, of some environmental issue. Or it just might be the sort of people using it don't have the education and uh, they might treat it a little rougher, um, unfortunately. These things have really happened and have blown up hardware in the field and we're going to explicitly design around them on our hardware to try and make the product more robust uh, to developing world conditions. Uh, it costs a few cents 
at the manufacture time to protect against these things. But if the thing goes down in the field, it might take weeks to get a new one out or replacements may not be available at all. Um, static electricity on an antenna, that can zap the receiver, uh, just say during a lightning storm, may not get a, a direct strike, just the, the high electric fields, can zap the receiver and make it deaf so it can't pick up packets anymore. Reverse polarity on a DC connector, um, just you know, hooking the battery up the wrong way around. Bzzz. Silicon loves that, um, but not hard to protect against. This has happened. 240 volts connected to a 12 volt DC connector. Poof! Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, you just get a wide range of AC. I don't know if any of you have ever been to places like India and things, but um, they often have big power conditioning boxes to keep the power within normal ranges so it doesn't zap things. You can get 350 volts AC if the, if the electricity network's just started up in the morning and there's not many people using it, or you get 110 volts AC. So you need a fairly wide range power supply that can handle that, plus a lot of glitches and spikes. Um, and that, that causes quite a lot of product to blow up in the field. Um, and a bunch of environmental things. There's some friends of mine who put Wi-Fi routers up poles in places of India. They get covered in green no, gunk all over the connectors after a few months just from uh, high, high humidity. Um, and a bunch of other environmental issues that we hope to uh, protect against. Uh, and the one I know a little bit about is lightning protection on FXS ports, which is the FXS port is where you plug your telephone into. This thing could be stringing you know, 20, 30 metres through the rain or in the mud before it gets to the telephone, and it could get zapped as well. Some ideas I'd like to leave you with. Um, cell networks is uh, closed, very strong licensing. Um, you have to do a lot of lobbying to open a new cell phone network. Um, cost per bit versus the internet where you have open standards and unlicensed. Pretty much anyone connect and very cheap. Just just goes to show you know, how much powerful phone ne networks could be if they're a little more open uh, like the internet is, how much more they could have brought to us. Community ownership of uh, telephone networks rather than big business or government. Um, some of our people who have been doing development for a long time have said this to me a few times, how many good projects have been ruined by money? So you see something sort of starting to work in the field, you throw a grant at it, and suddenly that distorts the whole thing and uh, the, the thing just fizzles and dies. So actually throwing money is not the solution. That's why we've arrived at, uh, I guess, our next iteration, which is uh, a business model around everything. Voice is the killer application. A lot of illiteracy in the, uh, in the uh, developing world. Everyone can talk, so everyone can use a telephone. And I guess uh, in the background there, we are building a, a nice little uh, uh, internet uh, backbone. So that could be used uh, in the future with some firmware upgrades to give people uh, internet connectivity as well. Um, another idea I've found through some, well, talking to some people and some research is that 60% of all calls are local. So we always think VoIP, you've got to have that big back end up and that big pipe, which is a problem in the developing world. You may not have a, an external link to the rest of the world or it may be very expensive. But there's a lot of utility in just being able to call your mum five kilometres down the road. Um, we take that for granted, but uh, the example I use is imagine uh, your mother's sick, you have to track down there and it might be half a day and that's time you could be spending earn earning a productive income or feeding yourself. So making a phone call over a five kilometres distance has a lot of economic value to someone who doesn't have any other connectivity. Um, the mesh potato is very, very open and it's useful in a lot of other ways. Um, we could unscrew the antenna on it, put a dish and have some Wi-Fi long shots. We could start connecting people meshes over 10 or 20 kilometres um, rather than uh, just in the, you know, a few houses down the block, for example. Um, the future for many people is the township. Um, over the next uh, couple of decades, per perhaps a third of the world's population. And you and I are going to help them get connected, I hope. And that's it. Thank you. managed to get connected? Cool. Look at that. That's the biggest mesh I've ever built. <laughs> you guys can help me test this thing. Yes? Yes. Yep. Anyone will be able to buy them. No. That'd be great. The more people using it, the better it is. Yeah. For a lot of reasons. Yes? Yeah. Numbering, I don't know about. Some of the other guys in the village telco team do. So you could ask a question to the um, 
the Google group. And I'll just put some links up there. Um, but yeah, connectivity, some, some governments were just stuffed. They won't allow this at all. Others uh, on the borderline, um, until recently it was illegal in South Africa, uh, but now it sort of is. Um, so but yeah, that is an issue. In that case, sometimes it's okay to just have a network that's not connected to other networks. Yeah, you know, if it's the middle of nowhere, no one's going to say much, sort of thing. But that is an issue. Yes. Mm. No, because it's open. <laughs> Everything's going to be open. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that's, I'll, that's, I guess that's something I, I would say we wouldn't be policing. But ultimately, yeah, that could be an issue, two people competing. But, you know, competing computers, competing operating systems, I don't think it's such a bad thing at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You could have the same network. They might do a deal where one of them routes to one area, one routes to another, or they both have different uh, bandwidth. They might better support each other. Yeah. Yes, Kim. Sorry, there was someone in here who had their hand up a moment ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I can give you an example. The OLPC people I was talking to the other day, they had special wide range adapters made. The AC adapters, exactly the same issue. So for that, you make sure the input components uh, can tolerate the wide range available. Most, for instance, most rectifier bridges at the input of a switch mode power supply will have a 350 volt blow voltage. So you bump it up to 450 or 500, you pay a cent or two more. But you do it in the factory where you're making 10,000 of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that would have to be addressed, I think, in the network. It's all um, basically Linux Asterix software, so those issues have been, I guess, addressed uh, for Asterix and can be addressed for this if necessary. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What you do is, just as it grows, you start segmenting uh, the network. For instance, those three antennas I had pointing, you might have them on different channels, and they're effective, effectively three different meshes. Um, in terms of how well, where you place them, how far, you really don't know. You stick them out there, you suck it in the seas, and you stick a, another node in between if it's not far, or you stick another backbone link. So um, there's no real easy way to calculate it. Um, I have made phone calls from Adelaide to the Fryfunk network. We've counted 20 hops. And about five or six of those are on the network. It was fine using both Skype and Asterix. So uh, yeah, it does work. We've done VoIP over mesh networks already. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, you had a question. Yes. Yeah, it is an issue. Um, at the moment, I guess we're targeting a country like South Africa that's got a mix of first world infrastructure and, and second world, people living in you know things like the townships. So on the edge of that, you have fairly fat pipes, but they have no penetration into the township. In other really developing countries, it's a big issue. Um, you know, there aren't any internet pipes around, so that's one that uh, we're relying on existing infrastructure. Uh, but they may be, there may be public switch telephone networks that we can switch into, uh, or existing cell phone networks. Yeah. So it, it is an issue, and, and one I guess we don't have a 100% solution for right now. Yeah. Sorry, yes? No, but it could. In fact, we've got... Anyone got no LPC on the mesh right now? I think... Uh, 
Yeah, there's a couple of OPCs on the mesh right now, so there's no reason why they couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question up the back. No. No, that uses I think 8011s or n or something. It's a it's a layer two protocol, whereas this is at the higher layer. So no, they're not the same protocol. Yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's sort of uh, something that I'm interested in playing around with. Um, you know, long distance Wi-Fi shot between them, join the meshes together. Uh, rather than being a commercial business, it could be the village that pulls together to buy one of these kits and the village next door because they've obviously got a lot of links and they point their access points at each other and bingo, they've got their little local telephone network. And then they might decide to make free phone calls. Good on them, you know, and uh, not have to get slugged, you know, 50 cents a minute for... Uh, uh, GSM. The situation telephony in some parts of the world is, I've, I've heard of situations where someone to ring an office 100 metres ago has to pick up a GSM handset just to talk 100 metres away. That's all there is. And it costs them heaps. Yes. Mm. I'd like to stick a few things these up around my neighbourhood as well. <laughs> Yes. Well, it's about, this, it's about the same CPU load, and we'd need some. Uh, the only issue at the moment with this chipset is getting the samples off and on the chip. But it's not impossible, yeah. Be happy to talk to you about that. A wide band potato. Low latency. The only thing is, we do have big delays on the uh, IP packets uh, for the, exactly the same issues you mentioned. Um, to get the Wi Fi performance, we, we're actually aggregating packets to 80 milliseconds. So, but the high bit rate, uh, the high bandwidth would be very welcome. Yeah, that would make it superior to a first world telephone, which would be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sorry? Or yeah, yeah, we'd go wide band on speaks, but uh, so it's a bit sexier right now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Thank you.